ten o'clock, this is Gordon Kitchen with the Radio Oxford News. Oxford United Football Club will close down within two weeks unless there's a massive injection of cash, according to a board announcement today. Got quite desperate, I think, because we was a couple of days from folding and then uh, it was got to a stage where we had a lot of team meetings with the manager, Bud Asprey, then, and uh, we, got to, we might have had to go on in cars to away matches and not have pre-match meals at grounds and whatever, just have you know, just a bit of soup or something. When a football club or any business owes a lot of money, uh, you're, you're in trouble. And uh, we were in that uh, plight and it looked for a long while as though we weren't going to get out of it. It was January 1982 and for Oxford United, after just 20 years in the Football League, the game, it seemed, was up. But then, days before the Manor Ground was due to close for the last time, the board played its final card and won. At five o'clock, this is Gordon Kitchen with the Radio Oxford News. Oxford United have been saved. United were due to close down within a fortnight, but now, after an approach from the Board of Directors, the Oxford publisher, Robert Maxwell, has agreed to give the club the £120,000 they need to avoid bankruptcy. Pleased to meet you. I was in Jamaica on holiday with friends who asked me whether I would be willing to save Oxford United from bankruptcy. And I said, why me? And really the answer is no. But if you can't find anybody else by the time I get back, then I will see what I can do to help you. And needless to say, they couldn't find anybody. Did That's you know anything I about the club at that time? I live in Oxford and Haddington. I paid a little attention to what they're doing, but no, I, the answer in short is no, I didn't know much about the club. The Oxford connection for Robert Maxwell was Pergamon Press and the British Printing and Communication Corporation, almost within shouting distance of the Manor Ground. And what a transformation it was for a hand-me-down club on the brink of collapse. Suddenly, they were owned by their neighbour at the big house down the road, one of the most powerful businessmen in Britain and certainly one of the best known and most controversial. He's a long-time Arsenal supporter with a reputation for a ruthless pursuit of success. A man of enormous wealth, capable of spending £113 million to buy the Daily Mirror Group. Oxford are now sponsored by one of his papers, The Sunday People, and the chairman never misses a chance to publicise and promote his football club. You did the series. Yes, I did. Talk yes, I... in the Daily Mirror. I think they go Oxford up. I'd, I'd like to think they go up as champions, but I'm not sure because I had no ambition about saving it. But once I'd assumed responsibility for it, then I treated it like any other business. It had to be grown. It had to be managed efficiently and run on proper business lines. And it wasn't being done at that time like that. No, that's not because the existing board by fools or anything like that. Most football clubs are run very unprofessionally from the business point of view. Within two months, Jim Smith was appointed manager to replace Ian Greaves, who left for Wolves. And Smith, still bitter from his sacking by Birmingham, set about lifting Oxford and along the way picking up a series of Manager of the Month awards. Although he knew of his chairman's reputation for hiring and firing, their relationship has been prosperous and stable. Any manager is under pressure to be successful, whatever we think. And uh, but I also believe uh, now meeting the man and knowing the man for uh, you know for two years, two and a half years, that I think he will always support the man he appoints, providing you don't do anything silly. And he will. All, I'm sure that he will always stick by me. I appoint a person to run a business, to run the club, which he's doing. And if he's no good, I'll replace him but as he's brilliant, there's no reason for me to tell him anything. Oxford were fifth in the third division when Jim Smith arrived. Not bad, but nothing compared with what was to follow. In Smith's first full season, they were third division champions, and big names began to fall at the manor, like Manchester United. After that draw, Oxford won the second replay with a goal from Steve Biggins, and they made £200,000 last season by reaching the fifth round of the Milk and FA Cups. In this season's Milk Cup, it was Arsenal, once Robert Maxwell's favourite club, who came and went. Lawrence takes over, a good-looking ball, Heather's in there. No, it's Aldridge, and it's gone in. And then a good overlap. Hamilton came to meet him.
Today, Oxford are joint top of the second division, and in 1984, they've lost only eight of their 52 games. Smith has bought eight of the present team at a top price of £80,000, and after selling players, the deficit on transfers is only 80000 But while Smith picks the player, Maxwell makes the bid. He has total non-involvement with my side of the job. He lets me get on with it. In fact, there's times we never speak as long as a fortnight, never speak to one another. He doesn't worry about the team that's going to be played or win, lose, or draw. Um, and also, of course, the one thing he does get involved in is all the transfer deals. And he, he handles all the contracts and transfer deals and does quite well with them, which I'm quite happy to uh, allow the chairman to do. I find it very strange every time one buys or sells a player dealing in warm bodies and human <laughs> beings. It's very odd. I can't get used to it, no. But unlike most clubs, really, yeah. you never pay in instalments, do you? It's always cash on the nose. Always cash on the nose, because I won't buy anybody or anything that I can't afford to pay for immediately. Oxford have, in fact, scored 163 goals since the start of last season and have lost just two of their last 34 league games. The second division match against Leeds United was 10 minutes old before Robert Maxwell drove his Rolls-Royce into the manor ground after yet another business meeting in London. He was to have an unfortunate welcome. And here's a chance for Wright. It's a goal for Leeds. Looks as though we might have scored. Or not. He was soon to be put right on that one, and before he'd reached his seat, it was worse. It's a good ball too, and here's Lorimer, 2-0 to Leeds. These days, Maxwell is sure of a warm welcome at the manor ground. The fans often chant his name from the terraces, and he's very much the hero. It was not always so. Some sensational football news this afternoon. The new Oxford United chairman, Robert Maxwell, has announced that the club is likely to merge with Reading next season and will play under the name Thames Valley Royals. The news has already brought a hostile reaction from United supporters. We were playing Doncaster Rose in a very important game for promotion. And uh, I had a phone call at 2 o'clock as we were kicking off at 3 to tell me that I was now the manager of Thames Valley <laughs> Royals. And... Uh, it threw me a little bit, but uh, I was just pleased I was going to be the manager. I wasn't out of work. <laughs> the next home match was held up for half an hour by fans demonstrating on the pitch. And until it was announced the merger had fallen through, Maxwell was the target of considerable hostility. That is what caused me to want to buy Manchester United. I would have abandoned Oxford precisely because some of the people behaved in such an irresponsible manner of this question of the merger of Reading... And Oxford. I mean, that, that was the motivation for Manchester United? That was the motivation for my wanting to leave Oxford, yes. Uh, a few weeks later, I understand, they were patting you on the back and jumping up and down. Um, does that mean the motivation to leave Oxford and go to another bigger club is gone? Yes. Uh, I had agreed in principle a price with Mr Edwards for, Oxford, for Manchester United. But the following Saturday, they were playing Luton and scored five goals against Luton. And Ron Atkinson said on your programme, I believe, each of these goals will cost Mr Maxwell a million pounds. And they really did ask me for an extra five million. I said, thank you very much. That's, that's, I'm not prepared to pay that. And so I stayed with Oxford, and I'm glad that I did, because the team and the fans and the, the manager in between us, we've got this club, really, going great guns. So we won't be hearing that Robert Maxwell is after an, another big club? No. Back at the Leeds match, things improve. Five minutes left in the first half, and Oxford dearly in need of a goal. down at half-time and the two men behind Oxford United go their separate ways. 
Certainly partially, Gary Briggs had hit a good goal from a corner just a few minutes before half time. But we've had another shot kicked off the line by David Langan at the Oxford end. He's done a crime to knock it long, to knock it forward. He'd have disgraced Even your drawings go straight to them. What are you trying to prove? I mean, why do we? I mean, we talked about the conditions, we talked about it, and all I ask of you is to knock it forward. It's a pumpkin, then. You really have got to worry about it, Well, we're worrying about you right now. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you do for 20 minutes? The first 20 minutes, Bike Square, Chansey. I can't believe it. Message received. And Hebert to float one. Hamilton's there at the far post. 2 2. And Aldridge is coming in. It's there. 3 2. He's clean through. He's got past the goalkeeper. Aldridge, 4 2. Aldridge! Not bad, 5. And Oxford United confirm their position at the top of the second division. There's no holding Oxford. They've scored 50 goals this season and they're on course for Division One. And yet, amid all the success, it's this manor ground that might well threaten Oxford's future every bit as much as the bank did three years ago. It needs safety work demanded by law and other improvements to bring it up to second division standard and if promoted first. The estimated bill, appropriately considering the chairman's newspaper bingo, a million pounds. About half will come from a ground improvements trust, but the rest will have to come from the club, and Maxwell says they can't spend that just to stand still. Instead, he wants the City Council to give the club this land on the outskirts of Oxford or a similar site suitable to the club, where they can build a new ground with a capacity of 25,000, a sports centre and superstore. The Council, says Maxwell, has refused. One of the promises made to me by the Council was that they will give Oxford United a new ground. They promised it at Marsden, and as soon as they got re-elected, they reversed their promise by one vote. And the councillors who were with me and who stuck to the truth of the promise were censured and removed from the chairmanship of committees because they didn't tell the shabby political line. The council say that they've offered a ground? No, they've offered nothing other than promises which they reneged. They made me a promise of Marston and then through political shenanigans they reversed themselves on that promise. And that's one of the most disgraceful episodes I have been witness to or participated in in British public life. When does the, the crunch come then on this? The crunch has come and has passed. If there is no, we're already two years too late about this new ground. So we really are in a pickle and have been entirely put there by the Oxford City Council. I regret to have to say they are labour controlled. His daughter Ghislaine, a director of the club, even led a demonstration at the opening of a new ice rink in the city last weekend. The money, they say, should have been spent on a new football ground. In this atmosphere, the battle between the former Labour MP and the Labour Council has become a bitter and, for the club, critical one. You said that unless they come up with the goods and the ground, uh, you may have to move out of Oxford with the club. Well, the question may have, will have. There is when no way in which we can play this. The end of this season? At the end of this season, we may get an extension of 12 months. That's very, very doubtful. But it's as close as that, yes. You may get Oxford United going up to the first division. And because of the appalling negligence of the Oxford City Council, that we could be wiped out and removed from Oxford. Uh, where That's possibly could you turn up then? We have no idea. Might even close. Might have to close. And that really is where Maxwell came in, although whether he would actually close the club is open to speculation. But after three years of Robert Maxwell, football chairman, one thing is absolutely clear Little Oxford will never be the same again. Have him playing for you next, Bob. What? You'll have him playing for you next. <laughs> yes, he'd make, he'd make a good, uh, what, strategist? Yes, I think. Sweeper. Sweeper. Thank you. <laughs> 
The latest development is a move for the England international Trevor Francis at Sampdoria, unthinkable pre-Maxwell, and naturally it was the Sunday Mirror that broke the story first. Explain what you do. Well, this is a very good story that we got you from your manager today, Mr. Jim Smith. After England, it's a famous right winger, Trevor Francis. I can give that away. No, I know. I can't pinch that. No, you can't. <laughs> There's no way that you can pinch that, Don, and neither can you, Richard. No, we've, got that. we've got that already, Smitty. <laughs>